Hi everybody, this is Patrick McCarthy reporting with Tri-Cities Community Television. We're on Westwood at our Fountainhead Studios here in Port Coquitlam. And today we have Councillor Trish Mandeo in the studios. Councillor, welcome to the studios. Thank just, you for having me. Well, you're welcome. And just to uh, just want to do a quick land acknowledgement. We are on the unceded territories of the Quaquitlam First Nations. And I know that's important for you for diversity, so I definitely want to be sure we pass that along. So first term councillor, four years, you know, um, just give us a sense of, of what that was like on the first four years, especially when you're going through a COVID experience, which I'm sure no one wanted to have. I know. I almost feel like we were robbed. Right. Uh, we got in barely two years in and then COVID happens. But I have to say, though, even with COVID, we managed to accomplish a lot. I think there's something to be said about having a functional council, about having um, a council that is progressive. And we managed to still have things going regardless of um, everything else that was going around us. Yeah. So just just. Um you know, in the community before you were elected as councillor, you, you know, you've been very active with a lot of societies and groups. So for, fo for those who, folks who don't really know, you can just kind of give us a summary of, of who you are and, and, uh, and what you stand for. Yes. So I call myself um, a community advocate. And even before I got elected, I was very immersed in the community, you know, whether it was through volunteering in the community or on boards, I was doing it all. Uh, I was involved with the Tri-City Chamber of Commerce on the business side. And in the community, I was work I was volunteering with Tri-City Transition. I was on the board for that. And um, yeah, anything that was in the community, you found me there. I was working with new immigrants as well. And um, with women, I had a nonprofit, Women's Collaborative Hub, that I am now, um, I am now emeritus on that organization. But we managed to empower so many women within the community through that organization. That's good. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, uh, I know women always need a strong advocate, you know, on, on both sides of the gender spectrum. And I know you've done a great job for that. So thank you, thank for, you. The, for the citizens of Coquitlam. So yeah. one of the things we're seeing in Coquitlam is this kind of, uh, you know, the new towers going up in the Coquitlam Center, you got Millardville. So, so on council growth is a big concern. We're managing it. Oh, can you give people a sense of what that means? Yes, yes. So I, I want to first educate people to say the growth that they're seeing today was voted for years ago. Mm. Right, the official city plan was done, and the community was engaged. And they they came and spoke to the council of that day, and the official city plan and the neighborhood plans were passed. So some of the towers that they see coming today were actually approved long before. So when I talk about managing growth, I'm talking about, yes, we know we've got the numbers, we've got the targets that we have to meet based on the regional growth and based on you know our um, provincial growth numbers that the government has put upon us. But what we need to do is to make sure that we're not impacting the neighborhoods too much. Because can you imagine if you're a resident and you end up with four developments going around you, mm. you know, your life is disturbed for many years. Because some of that development can take years to finish, right? So we have to make sure that as we are bringing these new towers, we are doing it in a manner that doesn't impact the lives of the, of the people that are living in the neighborhoods. And as well to look to concentrate the development along the SkyTrain, which is what we promised when we got the SkyTrain, that we would you know, put the, the high rises along the, um, the, corridor, the transportation corridor. Yeah, I appreciate that, because I, I know, mm -hmm. you know when you sort of live in a growing place, when it's constantly being dug up and, and built, mm -hmm. you're kind of feeling, when this is actually finished, I won't be, I probably won't be here. You know, so, uh, so I appreciate the least, least understanding. I think that, uh, I feel yeah. like it's an old person thing when you, when you say that, you know. But, yeah, and we don't want uh, to chase I'm people up. out of their neighborhoods either. Yeah. Right? So, so the, the thing though, I, I guess what I'm looking at is, you know, with growth and, and you know, Coquitlam is 138,000, you know, it's a, it's a big city in, the, in this mm -hmm. region. And now you're adding in these other towers. So where does that put us with number, with population once you've completed this OCP approved vision, like how, what's the population of Coquitlam going to be in the next five years? Oh, normally I have the numbers with me if I was on my desktop, yeah. but uh, we are actually right now we are closer to 150. We okay. are not at 138. Yeah. I think in 2016 we were around the 143, 145. Right. Um, in the population projections that Stats Canada has put out, puts us I think over 160. 
thousand right. in the next ten years or so. But um, don't quote me on those numbers. Yeah. But uh, we are experiencing quite a bit of growth. And if you look at CIC, the Canadian Immigration, they've also given us high numbers of the new immigrants that are coming in because we have that gap, right? Because our population is aging and we're not having enough babies to replace that population. So we, if, we, if we don't have immigration and immigrants coming in, we are going to have a big gap. And I think already we see how organizations are suffering when it comes to having staff, right? And some of them are closing their doors and only doing deliveries because they cannot get staff, right? So we have to find ways to bring in new people that can fill in in these roles. And immigration is just one of those. So if you look at it that way, if more immigrants come in, we already have a housing crisis. Where are we going to put them? Right? Mm -hmm. So we have to look at both of them concurrently and ensure that we are able to house those new people that are coming in. So how do we do that for people who are, you know, some immigrants may come here and they're you know, financially stable and, and some will come as refugees, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll come with challenges, which, um, and how do, how do we help those people? Yeah, so, so I, I see, you know, I just got um, elected onto the UBCM board as the third vice president there. I see the work of UBCM advocating with the province being so critical in this case. To where when you're having immigrants that are coming in, you don't want to just bring them in into a place that's going to be so difficult to where they can get housing, right? I get emails all the time by people that come and they're saying, you know, I've got a job here. If I go far, I can't afford to, you know, for the transportation to come, but to live in the community, I can't afford, right? Those are the things that we need to try to avoid. So how we can help or how we can solve that is by working with the province and ensuring that we have affordable housing, right? And Coquitlam has been really, really good. We, at, our, at our council, we have been good pushing the developers to say, as you're putting those high rises, can you please put in some affordable units in there? so that we can be able to, you know, to house those people either that are coming in or those that are already in our community that need that help, right? So yeah. it's all collaboration. Yeah, so I, but I also you hear the word market value and affordable. So to me, mm -hmm. can you def let, let folks understand what that means to you? Mm -hmm. And, and then when you, on the affordable side, how you sort of de define how you can support mm -hmm. affordable? <laughs> so normally when I hear the word affordable, I say affordable to whom? Correct, yeah. Right, because affordability has a, it's, it's on a spectrum, mm -hmm. right? So what we need to, to do is we need to build our communities thinking about the person that is earning the least amount or that doesn't have any income. They need housing that fits them. You've got the working middle, you know, which I sometimes say the, 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 the missing middle, right? Mm -hmm. We need to think about affordability for them. And then you've got those that you talked about that are coming in and they've got the cash and affordability for them is totally different, right? So we need to look at housing on a spectrum. Yeah. So how mm. is that OCP dealing with that or supporting it outside of just, I mean, just give me a sense, you know, I'm a young person, uh, me, me and my, my partner are, are mm -hmm. you know, make $75,000 a year mm -hmm. and we want to stay in Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. So what, what message would you, would you give those weeks? So when we talk about the official city plans, those are all about zoning, mm -hmm. right? We are zoning to say this is the kind of uh, buildings that are going to be approved for that particular area, right? Um, that doesn't address affordability on its own. Where the affordability comes in is when the developers are coming in and they're now wanting to build the housing, we can look at it and say, you know, for this, even though you've got your 30 tower on here, we want some affordable housing in there, right? The official city plan was already done. But now we are negotiating with the developers to say, we want our community to be livable. So yes, we don't want you to just have market value units in there, but we want you to consider, you know, putting in, you know, accessible units affordable units, below market housing, mm -hmm. right? And also to partner with um, the non-profit organizations that are within our community as well as with BC Housing so that they can be able to cater for those people that need that kind of housing. Yeah, so how do you think that's going? Because, you know, you, you talk about the U, UBCM and you've got mm -hmm. David Eby who was part of BC Housing and now maybe or is about to be you know, one mm -hmm. of the last two for, for Premier of the province. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, he commends Coquitlam for having a large rental pool, you mm -hmm. know, which is commendable to your council. But at the same time, there seems to be this push-pull, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who's, who's, who's doing the right thing kind of 
when it comes to affordable housing. So what's your yeah, general it, sense of that? As you mentioned, Coquitlam has been really forward thinking. You know, 10 years ago, mm. there were zero um, rental units in Coquitlam, especially purpose-built rental, yeah, that's right? Crazy. And in 10 years, we've come a long way, right? And, you know, so many are, in the, are on the way, and some are already there, right? And when David Eby talks, if you listen to most of his talks, he will give Coquitlam as an example, mm. because we're doing well, right? And But what, from my perspective, we need to not only have them as ones that are in line and coming, but we need them to be there, right? Which is the part that we as councillors cannot control, right? If a developer comes and they, they come before us and we approve the units and now we're waiting for them to build, we don't have any tools in our pockets yeah. to push them to do it, right? And right now with a perceived, um, you know, the market is so bad right now, right? Um, so you see them pulling back a little bit, but we already approved them. Mm. And the, the building permits are, wake, are waiting there. What can we do with that, right? Mm. We're just waiting. We're at the mercy of the developers. So how do you feel um, that the influence of developers? I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a developer and I mm. see this growth, I, I, you know, as a business person, I would see this as a greenfield opportunity. I, mm -hmm. you know, so, and of course, you, know, you need to kind of close those deals and, mm -hmm. and make those, those proposals pass. So how do you see the developers' um, um, from your perspective in Coquitlam. Could you restate the question? No. Just when you see it, you know, I, I was just saying as a, when you look at developers, this partnership that you're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. some folks are saying, will say to us, well, we can't be too hard on the developers because they won't want to build here. But, but to me, it's like, well, no, they need to build because there's a demand for it. Mm -hmm. We question the demand of where it comes from. But at the same time, you got some people say push harder on the developers. Some people say no. Some people say developers are influencing politics. Some people say, well, no, it's just part of the game. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious your general sense of, of the importance of developers and the things you need to be concerned about with developers. Yeah, that's why when I talk about mitigating growth, that's exactly what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. right? Some people say, push, have them give 50% mm -hmm. of the units being affordable. But as a business person myself, I look at the developer side and I'm going, when they look at that pro forma, it's not going to go, mm -hmm. right? They can do that because they are in business. They're, they're running a business. So the way I see how we can make strides is by us as a city partnering with the province, partnering with the federal government so that more funding can come in to subsidize. Coquitlam is done well because we've got the housing fund, right? Mm -hmm. So when we want those units from the developer, we're going to the developer and saying, we'll give you density if you give us one, two, three, four. Right. That's a, you know, um, a partnership that works because we're not only asking them because they are in a business, so we can ask them to say, hey, we have a higher housing crisis here, give it to us. But we have stake in the game and we say, here, we have this money that we want to give you and we can also work with you with density transfers or with the housing fund that we have so that we can be able to deliver those numbers that we want to deliver. So, how, uh, how are those affordable houses going to be managed once they're built? Is, it, is that the city doing that or is it th no, through? No, no, the, the city is not in that business, but uh, busy housing mm -hmm. and the, you know, the, the Minister of Housing, of course, through busy housing, they have partners like, for example, share, um, share community services. They, they manage housing. We've got the Vancouver Housing Society. There's so many organizations that are within the nonprofit sector that do uh, manage those housing units. Yeah. I know that's the typical response. Not typical. That sounds so negative, but it's sort of the the base response from cities to say we're not we're not in the housing business. Mm -hmm. But if you if you look at some best practices around the world, I mean, mm -hmm. UK has gone through this cycle of being involved and not being involved, and now mm -hmm. wanting to be more involved. So, if it's a if it's a viable business, mm -hmm. you know, for someone else to make money at it and have a viable business, why is it not something that the city would say outsource or become part of or use as a revenue mm -hmm. stream? What explain because that to? We are limited by the charter. Mm -hmm. The charter is a governance document that dictates what we as a city can do. And believe me, we get frustrated. Mm. Right? There's things that we're going, we're the ones that are on the ground, we're the ones that are seeing what's going on. But because, you know, if you look at um, the, the documents from Ontario, they actually say cities are the little brother mm. of the province. 
So the C as the, as the little brother, and the way that we can spend money is limited. We are at the mercy of the province when it comes to that, right? We are only collecting the money that we're collecting and can only use it for the municipal things such as sewer, roads, you know, uh, parks and such. So those are the things that are in our purview that we have to spend that money with on. The province has more money. The, the federal government has more money. So if we say we want to do it, they'll say, sure, go ahead. But where's the money? Do we go back and tax the residents? As a resident, I wouldn't want that. Mm. Right? Because that means you're being taxed so many times. They're already being taxed, and their tax dollars are going to the province and to the, to the, to the feds. Right? And now you want the city to collect more money in order to do the services. Right? Yeah. So there's a governance review that's needed here. And is by it going to happen? <laughs> your guess no, is I mean, as good. Your, your guess is as good as mine. But through UBCM, that's one of the things that we're pushing. Though. Right. So I mean, really, I think it's the option to do that. Because mm -hmm. you know, I think you would, as a councillor, uh, you, you know, one a person who votes municipally also votes mm -hmm. provincially and federally. And federally it's not yeah. like it's like you're, you know, three people. But mm -hmm. so I appreciate the candor on, on the feedback for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Inclusivity. You know, we did the opening land acknowledgement. Um, you know, for yourself, what does that mean to you in Coquitlam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I always start when I'm talking to people myself, I situate myself and I say I am a first generation settler mm. here, being that I am from Zimbabwe. And um, I actually lived, my, my grandparents lived on a reserve themselves. Mm sort of the same system that was here was also over there. So being that I'm a settler here now, I'm very cognizant of the wrongs of the, of, of the past, mm. right? And how we are trying to go towards reconciliation. And also being cognizant that reconciliation is not defined by me, but is defined by the indigenous peoples that were the settlers of this land, that were the take caretakers of this land since time immemorial. So, so to them right now, us acknowledging that these lands are unceded is important to them. And that's the least that we can do, is to acknowledge that, right? But uh, if you come from an um, in inclusivity point of view, Coquitlam has so many um, immigrants that are coming here. And we owe it to everyone that's moving here to know the history of these lands mm. and to be able to respect that, right? That's the only way that we can move forward as one humanity is by saying, you know, this is the history and this is what we need to acknowledge and this is how we can go forward, right? How do you feel that uh, the city of Coquitlam, the, the relationship with uh, Coquitlam First Nations is, is, I know the city of Poco just two couple months ago mm -hmm. come, came to an agreement. I mean, Coquitlam First Nations sits right between both of these mm -hmm. cities and there's some land claims, you know, when you talk about the uh, Riverview lands area. So just, just how you feel that relationship is, a good, bad, or, or areas that need to be improved? I'll start by covering whether it is good or bad, and then I'll talk about the areas of improvement. But um, we have a great, great relationship with our First Nation neighbors. You know, I think all of us on council can pick up the phone and call any of our colleagues on the nation. And on my part, I can call some of the residents in there as well, because they are my friends, mm -hmm. and they are people that I've built a relationship with. And it's so critical for us to have that, because in order to have reconciliation, the number one thing we can do is to build the relationship and to regain the trust. And the trust is what was lost through all the um, inequities of the past, right? So I, I love, also love to share the good example of what happened a few years ago after I got on council is the, our indigenous neighbors in Piquetlin came and, and, and shared that for years they were sneaking in, into the forests to look for the buck because they do a buck ceremony where they strip the buck and then they use it to make their straw hats and make other items. So when they came to our council, our, our staff actually said, why don't we do a buck ceremony together? We all met in Mandy Park and had one of the most beautiful buck ceremonies where they educated us on what they do when they're stripping that buck and what happens. You know, a couple of us actually went into um, Kwikwetli Nation and we spent the afternoon stripping the buck with them and learning what we, what we were doing, why we were doing it. And then they were supposed to invite us back when they were going to use the buck, but then COVID happened, right? But that ceremony was so beautiful and how much all of us learned, and how much 
they felt so free to now know that no, as a city, we are saying, if you need to do that, it's okay. Because they take care of those trees. They respect those trees. They have done that since time immemorial. And yet, up until that day that we did that, they were having to sneak around to do that. Yeah. So that's what happens when you build relationships and when you get to understand your neighbors and when you get to understand the people that are living amongst you, regardless of their background. Yeah, uh, and that's beautiful. I mean, uh, and it's great to, I think that kind of connecting is important. But there's, it's like, there's, there's a tension though, right? I mean, it, it, we're talking unceded lands, which equates to land claims and, and mm -hmm. sort of those tough conversations, which, mm -hmm. so how, do, how does, how, do, how, do, how does that, um, I mean, that must be tough. So I'm just curious, you know, in that sense, at some point you're gonna to come to a decision about land claims, or you're coming to a decision about, like Poco did, supplying services to, mm -hmm. to a piece of land. So just trying to your sense of thoughts around that and, and sort of the philosophy of that challenge. I don't, I don't see any tension on our part in the sense that I don't think they're coming over to saying, oh, your city hall is on our land, so we want that. Mm. No, most of the land claims are being done in conversations with the province, right? And all we ask as a city is when these conversations are happening, to ask the city to be at the table, right? Because we find throughout BC that a lot of times the province will get into conversations with the First Nations and the cities or the municipal governments are treated as a stakeholder, mm. right? We want to be treated as a partner so that we can know, because sometimes those conversations will impact the work that we do as a city. So all we ask is for us to be invited to the table so we can be on the know. Same thing that they're doing with Semikwa Ella, formerly known as Riverview. You know, when uh, BC Housing was having those conversations, they came to the city and we were invited to the table. Right, and that's all we ask. Okay, um, I, you know, I, one of your platforms is we, we talked a bit about housing, but I think it, the key for us is you know this sense of growth, but in an economic development. So, mm -hmm. for the folks out there, tell us a bit about what your view and vision is around that. Yes, yes. Even when I ran the first time, I always said you know Coquitlam is known as a bedroom community. And I think the time is gone for us to change that. We need to, to, to change how people view Coquitlam because we've got, we're surrounded by nature. We are surrounded by beauty. We can use that to get people to come in to fuel the economic um, growth that we can foster here in our city. And also we talk about having that balanced life, work-life balance. How beautiful will it be if we can get more office buildings so people don't have to go to Vancouver so they can leave work and play in Coquitlam. And how we can do that is by it, at any opportunity that we get, you know, whether it's through the high rises, to have office spaces in there and, you know, to look to see, can we have some staked industrial around here, right? Especially, you know, the Coca-Cola building was just, was just sold recently. It would be nice to have staked industrial. That way people can wake up and know they are commuting five minutes or they're riding their bike, right? That's where we need to get to uh, if we are going to foster the sustainability and if we are to fulfill the ESGs, the environmental sustain sustainability goals, we need to see how we can build complete cities and keep people to be, you know, in our area rather than going far. Yeah. So I see us as being creative in bringing in businesses, luring businesses. If we can have an anchor, that would be great because then the other businesses that will support that anchor can then come in. So, so one of the things we, we uh, what I, what I, what I guess for me is when you're run, now running for a second time mm -hmm. and, and obviously it's very hard to get on council. Mm -hmm. and, and so your thoughts about, you know, to be successful in council, and I think Craig Hodge, when, you, when they had the sort of um, citizens forum on how to run for council, mm -hmm. so he was using the words like fifteen to $30,000 for a successful chance, right? How, how, what, 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 what things about this sort of funding your campaign and campaign financing uh, could you comment about or, or things that you find uh, fair and reasonable and things you find a little uh, maybe unreasonable? It's funny, when I ran the first time, I almost wanted to run a zero dollar campaign mm. because I, it was hard for me to raise money. And I raised second from the lowest, I raised $9,000 the yeah. first time, which hardly could pay for much, you know, being we're a big city, right? Um, so I, say, I, I tell people, what, you ha what you're bringing to the table and how you communicate it and how hard you work to get to the voters, 
mirrors. It's not all about the dollar, mm. right? Um, and I'm proof of that. I yeah. didn't spend $30,000 the first time. Um, even now, I'm not seeking to, to have a lot of money. I'm seeking to connect with the residents, because that's what matters, really. Yeah. And so what is, uh, anyway, you always hear about this mailer, the, the, the city's mm -hmm. mailer, and, and mm -hmm. I think last, last, last election it was, I, don't, I mean, $6,000. I mean, the number seems to change. This year, they're talking it's eight, north of eight. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when I first heard that, it sounded like, well, this is a great way to share resources to get the message out. But it, it, there seems to be, uh, the other side sees that it still as a barrier. You know, I mean, if you're running for council and you can't raise that number, you're not in the mailer. So just um, looking out, you know, now you're in there looking out at that, you mm -hmm. know, what is your thoughts around that? So, so we are lucky, by the way, that our city does this mailer because I was talking to a colleague in Port Coquitlam mm. and they have to do their own mailing. And they're paying almost the same amount is what Coquitlam pays when we do this mass mailing together. So what it is is you, you, you're having more people, this pretty much this power in numbers, right? So the city is saying, how many of you want to do this so that we can lower the fees, right? So for me, when I did it the first time, that's all I wanted to, to get there. I said, I don't have to pay money for anything else. I didn't have any ads. I didn't pay for much. I just wanted to raise enough, my, uh, enough money for that mail, yeah, mm. for that mail, mail out. So... Yes, it's a, it's a good thing that's happening. And I would encourage anyone that's doing it to say, if you're going to raise money, just say if you can have that amount. That's the basic, the, the, you know, the, the, the basic amount that you can raise so that you can be in that mailing. And how it's important also is all the condos. You can go and deliver the flyers in a condo, right, because of the strata regulations. So the mailia, <laughs> mailia, sorry. The mail out. It's okay. I've, I've been saying wrong words all day. I know. I know. <laughs> uh, the mail out allows you to yeah. get into every household. So yeah. I, I thank the city for coordinating it and for getting the numbers to be yeah. lower. Otherwise, anyone can do it on their own, but the numbers are going to be really high. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that uh, response. I mean, only because um, in many cases, I think people are surprised that they have to raise so much money. So I mean, mm -hmm. that's a different thing. And then, of course, when you're there, it's a, it's a shock when you have to raise it so quickly. But mm -hmm. I think if you're probably, uh, the more we talk about this mailer, the more people see the value mm -hmm. the, the, and, the, and uh, the chance to participate. We've got probably two questions. I and mean, one is, the last one is yours. Um, but the next one is just, we're seeing this sustainability, uh, instead of you know, the floods, the fires, that kind of stuff. And so really quickly, like, where is the city in, in, in going in that direction? And what are we doing to help? you know, that, that future generation around these, these key mm. topics. Yeah, so as a governance junkie that I am, uh, you, you will hear at the table I'm always pushing for ESGs, the Environmental Sustainability Goals. So what that does is it, it allows us, if we, if we adapt that system, it allows us to infuse that environmental lens in everything. Mm. And our staff has been doing an amazing job, but what we need is from the uh, upper levels of government, we need to have those ways to measure the success, right? Because you often hear people coming in and saying, you know, oh, by 2030, we want to do this. We have to be at, you know, at, at um, zero emissions by this time. We're just throwing numbers, but there's no pathway to get there. And there are no metrics to measure that success in the meantime. When you do the ESGs the proper way, you have the KPIs, you know, the key performance indicators so that you can know how you're doing and you can know how to cost adjust when you're not doing things right. So yes, um, municipalities are tasked right now by being creative on their own without that overarching guidance from the province or from the, uh, from the feds. We are tasked to be able to do what we can to in what's in our purview to limit those carbon emissions and to go towards the, our sustainability goals. In the city of Coquitlam, we just did our sustainability plan. And we're going to be implementing it here in the near future. And we're going to be going to the community to get them engaged, to say, what is it that you want to see? And together, we really can move forward. It, it isn't one where you come from the top down, but it's a collaborative approach. Because in order for us to, to, to hit our sustainability goals, it takes each and every one of us. Yeah, so, so I mean, I think those targets are pretty tight in the sense of the next few years, you're gonna, you have a very short window. So 
is it the city looking to lead, besides collaboration, looking at leading it by example? Is there, there are things that the city's doing with its fleets, or they're doing anything with its buildings, or the developer kind of uh, requirements? Is, is there any sense of what's happening there? Yeah, I think we're doing it all of the above. Okay, perfect. All of the above. We are, you know, we are replacing our fleets, you know, our fleets with uh, EVs, and we have been putting the EV charges all over the place. And we are doing our tree campaign to try to have more oxygen in the air. We've got our ten thousand tree campaign, um, and you know, it's, it's, if you look at our sustainability plan, that the stuff just amazingly dead. It comes with so many ways that we can be, you know, collaboratively moving towards those goals. Well, it'd be great because I think there's, there's some things that you're doing there that we should know about, but we don't. Um, mm -hmm. Last question is obviously you're, you're going for your second term as councilwoman. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to the folks out there who, who voted for you last time or are on the fence and want to pick a good candidate for this, this campaign? Yeah, for sure. I want to, first of all, I want to thank them for entrusting me with their vote in 2018. And I also want to tell them that, you know, they can be rest assured that I worked so hard for them. There's so many things that I did as a first time counselor that even, you know, uh, my colleagues will look and say, wow, you did a lot, right? Because that's who I am. When I put my name forward, I give 1000%, right? And, and I've been at the table. I listened to the community and not once did I ever do a vote that I did from a personal interest, but I look out to what's good for the Coquitlam because I know that the decision that I make today is a decision that will impact Coquitlam tomorrow. And if interested by their, if they entrust me with their vote once again, they can be rest assured that I will continue to work hard for them and that I will continue to bring in my expertise uh, in my voice that will bring different questions. Because we are a governing body after all. And good governance is good leadership. And good leadership is good governance. Well, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, we, that's, that's Councillor Trish Mandale. She is running for re-election at the city of Coquitlam for councillor. Again, this is Tri-Cities Community Television. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Councillor. Thank we you so much.